one of the main disagreements between the U.S. and the Netanyahu administration right now is the reoccupation of Gaza. It seems that the Netanyahu administration is willing to keep control of this part, but the U.S. foreign policy is not in agreement with this decision. How do you see this issue? This is a very uh, fundamental issue because it goes to a deeper question, which is what is the political resolution of all of this. Uh, it needs to be a Palestinian state, but that's exactly what the Netanyahu government opposes. So this is why we're in this crisis to begin with, that uh, there has not been uh, a Palestinian state established uh, despite more than 50 years of talking about it. And Netanyahu, who has been prime minister over most of the last 15 years in Israel actively opposes a Palestinian state, actively opposes any limits on uh, Israeli settlers in occupied Palestinian land, actively opposes uh, Palestinian uh, rights uh, in East Jerusalem. So there's no political solution. We have therefore seething unrest uh, the terrorist uh, attack by Hamas on October 7, now a uh, brutal war uh, filled with war crimes uh, committed by Israel, but no political outcome because Netanyahu and his right-wing government don't want to uh, acknowledge Palestinian political rights. Uh, and this is the crux of the matter. The United States uh, is uh, mumbling the right things, but typically in U.S. politics, uh, the U.S. will back Israel because our politicians are trained to believe that uh, if they show any uh, real resistance to Israeli politics, uh, they'll get punished domestically by uh, Jewish voters or by Christian Zionists, and there are a lot of those. So uh, this is uh, the issue. There's a clear path to peace, in my view, which is a Palestinian state. Uh, Netanyahu opposes that. The U.S. <coughs> uh, is torn because it wants to support Israel, and yet at the same time, uh, Israel's position is untenable. And that's what this uh, argument is about. It seems that the U.S. official policy in Israel is this two-state solution, as Anthony Blinken said in his last meeting with Mahmoud Abbas. How is that possible? Because we have the West Bank and we have the Gaza Strip. How we can connect these two parts? They, they, there are many things in, in these discussions to be considered. Some people are suggesting one-state solution, something like Belgium, what we're seeing in Belgium. On the other part, you 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 mentioned two state solution like in Cyprus, North Cyprus and South Cyprus. We have the presence of UN at the middle. Of course, uh, over decades, it's uh, become harder to solve because Israel, uh, quite cynically and knowingly, uh, launched a, a settler campaign in the occupied territories beginning in the early 1970s. This wasn't spontaneous. This was part of Israel's. Uh, security moves under something at the time called the Alone Plan. Uh, and the idea was to make settlements in strategic areas in the West Bank. Um, and they've done that. And there are now hundreds of thousands uh, by uh, one count to more than 400,000 uh, settlers in Palestine uh, in the West Bank and another 200,000 plus in East Jerusalem. So <laughs> this makes things difficult. Uh, the uh, taste for a one-state solution is essentially zero. Uh, I, I think it, uh, in theory, could have a lot of merit, but it has no support uh, in uh, either side of this crisis. So I think uh, combining that with the fact that there are 50 plus years of UN resolutions on the two-state solution, uh, we should focus on implementing what has been promised and committed for decades, but never achieved. And I believe it's time for the Security Council to meet tomorrow and vote 
a Palestinian state and uh, membership in the United Nations and to tell Israel that's the reality. It's not about your negotiations uh, with the Palestinian Authority or anything else. This is a, a, a new world of a Palestinian state and they're a UN member state uh, and uh, you have to uh, clear from occupied uh, lands. Now, clearing, uh, I think it, personally, it would be fine for settlers to remain in their villages uh, in Palestine. Th those are details uh, in my view, uh, significant ones, but the most important thing is to declare a Palestinian state and to disarm the uh, the militias uh, as part of an overall peace settlement that establishes Palestinian political rights. In Palestine, we have two authorities. We have the Gaza Strip, we have the West Bank. Is there any connection between them? Do they have any relations? How does it work? Well, ba basically, uh, neither uh, Hamas nor the Palestinian uh, Authority are really uh, viable representatives of uh, Palestine. Uh, Hamas uh, has committed uh, terrorist atrocities uh, and uh, ruled itself out from that. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is basically uh, manipulated by the United States uh, and uh, Israel because its funding uh, is uh, controlled uh, essentially from the United States uh, and Israel. So I think the uh, fact is uh, it's hard to have a responsible authority without a state. It's time to have a state first, uh, construct uh, a process to build uh, a, uh, a national government that would cover both the uh, uh, Gaza and the West Bank. I think there needs to be also a physical connection between the two so that there's travel between the two areas. So there needs to be a transport corridor uh, and uh, other uh, basic features of sovereignty that make uh, this a viable state. Um, but I think we just need to pick up the pace because uh, you had the Oslo peace process 10 years, didn't lead anywhere. Uh, there are too many uh, on both sides, but uh, many in Israel that just don't want an outcome uh, of two states and they're able to block it nonstop. The rest of the world wants a two state solution because Frankly, our global peace depends on it. Uh, this is uh, awful to have these wars break out every few years. Uh, and so it's time really for the Security Council uh, unanimously and the General Assembly, maybe by a vote of 192 to 1, if that's what it takes, <laughs> with Israel being the only one not on side, to establish uh, the basic parameters of peace. How do you see the Netanyahu administration? It seems to me that they don't have any long-term policy for that region. At the end of the day, they have to learn how to live, how to coexist with these Arab nations. To make yeah, Of course, but uh, they've never believed that. And they thought that the U.S. has their back. Uh, but if you look at history, the U.S. has had the back of a lot of countries that it didn't uh, actually protect in the end. So Israel should be smarter than that. Uh, and uh, it's it, it, it's it's a big mistake of uh, policy, but their politicians are not visionaries. They're very rarely statesmen. Uh, Netanyahu is uh, fighting for his political life uh, hour by hour right now, day by day. Uh, they have no long term answer to these questions. They believe uh, for the moment that U.S. support is safe, but even in the U.S. we see uh, huge differences uh, between young people and older people. Older people tend to be uh, much more pro-Israel, younger people much more pro-Palestine. Uh, so uh, the Israelis should understand this is uh, absolutely an unsustainable course, uh, morally, politically, geopolitically, militarily, everything. They need to do something else. Right now, we have some sort of agreement between Sunni and Shia all together against Israel. How the geopolitical of that region is changing, in your opinion? Well, I think it's a very important question because one of uh, Israel's claims is uh, we just have implacable foes and there's no one to talk to. And uh, this is false. Uh, first, uh, uh, there absolutely were uh, Palestinian counterparts to talk to, um, and the Israelis 
in my view, never wanted to talk straightforwardly with them. They always wanted a deal, which was uh, not really uh, an adequate deal. Then came uh, the question of the Arab states. Uh, and uh, the Arab states uh, have, were viewed by Israel as implacable enemies, but the Arab states said back in 2002, more than 20 years ago, look, make a two-state solution. We normalize relations with you. We uh, work for the security of both Israel and the Palestinian state. Uh, the conflict is over. That was the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative. Did Israel grab at it? No, uh, because there were forces in Israel that said, we don't want to compromise. We want the greater Israel, you know, territorially. Uh, this is religious zealotry or cynicism or misguided ideas about security. It's actually a mix of all of those. But in any event, no, they did not rise to the occasion. Then their argument was, oh, OK, maybe uh, the uh, Arabs, but uh, Iran is an implacable foe. This also is not true. Uh, actually, Iran has tried for a number of years to negotiate. Uh, the most important negotiation, of course, was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, negotiated between Iran uh, and Europe and the United States over uh, ending sanctions uh, and Iran ending its nuclear program, uh, bringing it under control. Signed, sealed, <laughs> and then reneged on by the United States, uh, which says, we're not going to do it. That's diplomacy. Then they say, oh, you can't negotiate with Iran. Well, Iran negotiated. Then uh, it said, well, Iran is a renegade state, but Iran has just made uh, peaceful relations uh, and reconciliation with Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's a big deal, because if the Saudis want peace, uh, Iran is going to go along with this, because Iran is uh, becoming part of the neighborhood uh, in an absolutely diplomatic way. Iran is joining the BRICS countries. So that means, uh, is Iran going to say, we continue our war with Israel, uh, even as Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Ethiopia, all the BRICS say, no, you don't? Are they really going to do that? No, they're not going to do that. So we have the makings of a diplomatic settlement. Uh, I think the big responsibility is for Netanyahu to step down today because he's a failure uh, and uh, did not protect Israel and is a very divisive figure and opposed a political settlement. And for an Israeli government to reach out to the Arab neighbors and say, OK, we want peace. We accept a two state solution. Uh, we need uh, the UN to take responsibility. We need peacekeepers. We need uh, de mobilization of Hamas uh, and disarmament of the militias and many other things, but all of that's within reach. Uh, of course, Netanyahu is not going to be the one to say it, but he shouldn't be prime minister. You talk about Netanyahu, as long as I remember he was in charge, he was in power in Israel. Is there any alternative for his administration in Israel? I'm much older than you. <laughs> So I easily remember many, many, many prime ministers other than Netanyahu. He's finished. It's time for him to go. Uh, there will be so many new politicians. Politicians come and go. Uh, there are not indispensable politicians. Uh, and uh, what there is, is the structural realities. Uh, and Israel's structural reality is that it needs to accept the Palestinian state and it needs to make peace with its neighbors. And uh, I'm sure that there are going to be politicians uh, that will fill the bill because uh, politics is, uh, you know, is, is uh, like a job search. Uh, you put up a, a, a terms of reference and uh, you get 100 applicants and you choose one of them. So the terms of reference are make peace, uh, stop this uh, bloody war, uh, and uh, we'll find a lot of applicants for that position. Turkey has a very crucial, important role for Israel. How do you see the relations right now? Of course, Israel and Turkey uh, have had good relations and Erdogan uh, had good relations with Israel, but Erdogan is saying right now, you're committing war crimes, you need to stop this. 
uh, and Turkey is uh, referring, uh, uh, making a referral to the International Criminal Court of the Israeli leaders because they're committing war crimes. So Erdogan is uh, standing up for the Palestinian position. He's right to do so, in my view. Uh, he's not anti-Israel, but he is absolutely against this war, uh, and he's calling it straight. Now, there was an important meeting in Riyadh a few days ago uh, that is called the Arab Islamic Summit, uh, that uh, was both the Arab leaders, uh, Saudis, uh, Egyptians, Jordanians, uh, Syria, uh, with Bashar al-Assad going, uh, also Turkey, uh, uh, very important, also uh, Iran. So this is very interesting. You know, the region is finding a new language of cooperation. Uh, it needs to, the climate crisis, the energy crisis, uh, the uh, economic crisis uh, is all very severe. And uh, the leaders uh, of the OIC, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation are meeting together and cooperating together. Uh, and uh, I'm excited by the fact that uh, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, uh, Iran, uh, Ethiopia, uh, actually, uh, but uh, the, the four Muslim countries are all joining the BRICS. Good. Uh, this is a, a lot of regional cooperation uh, that I think is quite important. And I think Erdogan uh, plays a constructive role in that and aims to play a constructive role. How much is the influence of the U.S. foreign policy on the Netanyahu administration, on, on Israel? How do you see this? Can they force them to do something? Can they pressure them to do something, in your opinion? Yes, uh, I would say the U.S. influence is decisive because uh, if the U.S. Uh, does not have Israel's back militarily, Israel has to uh, have a political approach. Israel needs artillery shells. It, it needs uh, uh, the backing of uh, the U.S. fleet. It needs uh, military support, uh, financial support. If the United States says, no, you have to stop, <laughs> believe me, Israel will stop. It won't take long. What is Israel going to do? It, it depends on the United States. But the idea has been all along that Israel has the upper hand because of U.S. domestic politics, but I think that this is changing. Do you see any possibility of a larger war in that region? Because we remember we had during in Syria, during Obama administration, we had some sort of false flag attacks, operations. And do you see anything like that to happen in that region? I would say for two reasons, the answer is yes. Uh, one is that sparks are flying, missiles are flying. Uh, American soldiers are being attacked and wounded. Um, Israel is uh, bombing uh, uh, southern Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah is firing missiles. Uh, there's every reason that this can spread. But I would say a second reason is uh, my guess is uh, that Netanyahu would like it to spread. Uh, because uh, if it doesn't uh, spread, uh, the pressure is going to come on Israel to uh, end what they're doing. Uh, and uh, what Netanyahu wants to do, I think, is to ensnare the United States into direct fighting. Ah, oh, that would be horrible. Uh, it would be devastating for Biden's politics. So I think the U.S. will stay away, except if one of these missiles kills a lot of U.S. soldiers, it becomes uh, very hard in the U.S. also uh, to uh, resist retaliation and escalation. So we need to end this before something gets out of hand. Uh, wars like this can really get out of hand fast. Some politicians in the U.S., Lindsey Graham, is suggesting attacking Iran, bombing Iran. I talked with Colonel Larry Wilkerson. He, he said that it's impossible. We studied if we can win in, in a war with Iran, in a conventional war like Russia is doing in Ukraine. It's impossible to win this war without going nuclear. How do you see this issue? Is that a viable choice? Why are you suggesting that? Well, I would say two things. One, I'm uh, very interested to hear what uh, Wilkerson says, because he knows more about this than I do. And second, I can tell you Lindsey Graham's an idiot. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry to say it. You know, we have senators that are idiots and Lindsey Graham is a fool uh, and he's been a fool all along and he's very dangerous and there isn't a war that he doesn't love. Uh, and he has uh, 
pushed uh, the Ukraine war to complete disaster for Ukraine. And now he wants war in the Middle East. Uh, he's a fool. That's it. If this conflict goes to Hezbollah, then Syria, then Iran, it would bring in Russia and finally possibly China in this conflict. Look, all wars can spread uh, when, uh, when uh, sparks are flying or bullets are flying or missiles are flying. Uh, you can always detonate uh, the next uh, uh, weapons depot deliberately or inadvertently. You can always trigger another escalation. I, I don't think you can look at this and consider uh, these people geniuses uh, that are involved in this. Uh, they operate by limited information, gut, uh, their domestic politics, uh, their moods. Uh, and so this is very, very dangerous. Never let wars go on that can be stopped by negotiation because things can get out of hand. You know, it was a couple bullets, few bullets that started World War I. Uh, and um, we should not underestimate the risks of this. Same with Ukraine, even till today. These wars need to stop. Uh, they need to stop through negotiation now. And uh, it has been uh, US mistakes of not understanding negotiation. In uh, Ukraine, the US has rejected all negotiations up until now. Um, in the Middle East, I think they sense they need to do something different because the whole world is, is aligned uh, against this war. Uh, other than Israel. Um, and so I think the US uh, is US leadership is feeling the uh, tensions much more than uh, in Ukraine. And that's why we're hearing even semi reasonable things coming from the White House. They're not acting on them yet. Because again, politicians in the US are afraid to stand up to Israel typically because of uh, their perceived uh, risk of uh, political backlash at home. But they're going to learn uh, standing with Israel in an intolerable uh, <coughs> war that has no political solution offered by the Israelis. It doesn't work for US security. It's just way too dangerous. So I think events are going to move forward, but they could get out of hand before they reach uh, a settlement. So I'm urging a settlement as absolutely as fast as possible.